It was well coached. You know, he's, he's very technically sound in his, uh, you know, in his technique, his fundamentals. He's got great eye discipline. You know, good footwork, good hands, good quickness. He's got good bend. And then uh, I just needed somebody that really understood um, what our offense is all about and the system that he uh, that he's running right now. He he fits in there quite. East Coast West Coast. We are doing our fourth uh, East Coast West Coast show. Uh, today, we're going to speak with uh, one of our athletes, Jarrett Patterson. Um, uh, we'll kind of, we'll start off with, uh, by talking to also uh, his father, uh, David Patterson Sr. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into kind of uh, how we, uh, how we met and uh, how this all, uh, uh, how his process got started. Um, as always, moderating the call and uh, for a little bit extra comedic uh, uh, value, we got uh, Ch uh, Anthony Ciccarelli, my cousin. Um, Call him Chicky. So um, let's just get started here. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over to uh, to Daniel, David Senior, and um, just kind of talk about you know what uh, what kind of he uh, what he went through to find a, a strength coach for uh, his first son, uh, David Patterson. They um, they came from Woodbridge, which is one of the Irvine schools. Um, kind of just want to you know kind of talk to David. He always. Uh, Likes to tell a story about how, uh, how he went through the process of, of trying to get his uh, his boys dialed in for uh, for football. So you know, David, if you could just kind of tell everybody, you know, kind of what uh, you know what you did, what you were looking for, you know, why you decided to find a strength coach, you know, what what, what was that whole process? Yeah, I mean, the process started. It's been uh, gosh, it's been I think ten years. I think it was two thousand and ten, two thousand eleven. Um, David had. Um, been playing football for Woodbridge. He had a, a nice freshman year. He was um, a little taller, a little bigger than most guys. I mean, no, nobody had an idea you know, how it would turn out for him, let alone Jared, you know, at that stage. But um, he was entering his uh, sophomore year, and there was some talk that, you know, he was going to be you know, involved at the varsity level. But he was a little lean. And, um, you know, David came up to me, approached me, and said, Dad, I want to get um, – I want to get bigger. I want to get stronger. Can you help me? So we started looking around. We looked around. I made a lot of calls to Irvine, some you know, so-called commercial gyms, if you will. We met with a few folks. And, um, you know, after meeting with them and you know, touring their facilities, you know, it just wasn't the right place. And it just they weren't specifically designed for strength and conditioning, let alone, you know, football-specific exercises. So I opened up Google started searching around and, you know, you popped up East coast, West coast and, uh, made some calls. And then finally we got together and, um, I, I told you what we were trying to do and, and you said, Hey, bring them down. Let's meet and we'll go over it. And, and then it yeah. worked out, you know, you, um, yeah, you said, it let's do it. Out. Yep. That, uh, that was kind of funny. You know, you, uh, at the time I was, uh, I was working a lot. We had just started the corporate wellness programs. And I know it was very busy at the time, um, but, uh, um, you know, I was also working at Experian, uh, you know, as a strategic, uh, strategic finance analyst doing uh, competitive intelligence. And I know uh, at the time I didn't, uh, I didn't have a lot of time. So, uh, you know, making a little bit of time for, for David to get in there was, uh, was a stretch. Um, but I'm glad that I did because, uh, you know, they both yeah. work so hard, you know, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, David's timeline is kind of funny. You know, he, uh, I think you guys came in just before sophomore year started, right? Just, and, I think like, like, uh, I want to say it was September, like a couple of weeks into his, you know, his sophomore season starting. Yeah. Um, he had, you know, we, we did, there'd been a little bit of a time between, you know, me calling you and, you know, was getting together and, and he was really adamant. He's like, dad, you know, this guy's got to call you what's going on. Yeah. So, um, you know, he was really pushing for it. And uh, at the time, we actually bought some, uh, some nice home equipment, gym uh, equipment for, for the house. So he didn't work out. I mean, nothing like, you know, we do in the gym there, but it was just to get him going. And uh, he was really keen on it. You know, he, he wanted to do this. So, Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's kind of one of the things that I think will define most of the players that, uh, that step up and go on to play at the next level is they're self-motivated, you know, and I think uh, both David and Jared, you know, had that quality, you know, they yeah. both wanted to play. They both wanted to start. Um, I know that as a sophomore, David had, uh, 
um, you know, he was kind of waiting to get in and play. And I think after yeah. was it the third game, um, I think we'd put on, I think I'd seen him, uh, what, for maybe like three months. And we had already put like, uh, I don't know, I think close to 20 pounds on him within like three months. And yeah, then, he, uh, um, he, he grew fast. Um, it was the latter part of the season. He, he established himself as a starter. And, uh, you know, for Woodbridge that year, they went into the uh, CIF playoffs. And David went there with him starting. So, um, you know, he kind of cemented himself in there at the yeah. O-line position as a sophomore. So, and it was, you know, obviously from the training um, and the strength it really was. Yeah. yeah, well, his attitude and his work ethic uh, didn't hurt him either on that. You know, he he wanted to get out there and he wanted to work his ass off. So, you know. No, true. I, I mean, um, you know, we, we share, I mean, actually, you know, we, I mean, we, when I say we, we went to the to train with you on Sundays and Mondays and Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And a lot of teenagers aren't thinking about, hey, I got to go lift on Sunday morning and I got to be there at nine and lift for a few hours. And then Mondays after, you know, practice, you know, heading over to the gym, you know, again, you really have to have your heart set on, hey, tired, had a long day, but I need to go get better. That's what he did. I, yeah. I remember that. I was living with Scott when he was training with them. And we would get done work. We'd work out at like 5, 530 or something, mm -hmm. right? And he'd show up there later yep. that night when everybody was leaving the gym. And I was like, this kid just got done with practice. And here he is. Yeah. Training. And I would ask him. I mean, there were days I could see he had he'd been hurting. It was like a long day. And I'm like, hey, you want me to call Scott? He's like, for what? He's let's go. So, and again, the same for his brother. You know, they're the same. They're exactly the same. And you couldn't, you couldn't keep him out of the gym. You couldn't keep him from going to train. Yeah. Back then, you know, I was still competing in strongman. So adding on like uh, new athletes and new people into the, the already busy schedule was kind of yeah. tough. But I kind of I remember, you know, evaluating him and just uh, kind of checking out his attitude and seeing kind of, yeah. you know, whether or not he really wanted to do it, you know, because, uh, you know, you always hear me say, like, I don't want to train anyone that doesn't want to train here. Exactly. You know, exactly. if you want to if you fit into this program, you fit into the program, you know, if, uh, yeah. if you don't really have that discipline and that work ethic, then I'm not really interested, you know, in an athlete unless they're willing to show up and, and put the time to work in. Because if you're not here, I can't right. do anything for you, you know, yeah. and then it's a waste exactly. of everyone's time. So you know, time for me is a, is a big deal. So, if, you know, if you're, if you're into wasting your own time, don't bother with mine, you know, I'm not going to give you right. the time. Anymore. But uh, both the boys were definitely um, hardworking, disciplined kids. They always showed up no matter how tired they were. And not only that, they put the time in at the, the, at the dinner table, too. So, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, David and, and Julie, their parents, they bust their asses to always make sure that David and Jared always got the, you know, the proper uh, nutrition that they needed to, you know, to grow and stay anabolic um, while they were in season even. And I believe, you know, uh, David was putting on weight during the season where most kids were losing 10, 15 pounds. I think David throughout the season, I think every single time he gained at least 15 or 20 pounds during the season, which is very unique. And he's getting stronger throughout the season. So the competitive advantage is just huge, you know, when you're, when you have that kind of discipline and work ethic and you have the right program to, you know, kind of like put that weight on you, you know? So it's, it it's actually, it's, it's incredible because I remember in high school when all of us started wrestling year round and just an example of like going that extra mile you would see the kids on my team that started wrestling year round. We had won, let's say 15 or 20 matches individually the year before the following year, we'd been 30 matches and not the team itself wouldn't change. Our conference didn't change so much, right. but individually those of us who were going and wrestling after practice, going right. home eating and then going to another three hour practice to like 10 o'clock at night. Right. You say like the plus minus was like 10 or 15 wins additionally every year. Yeah. And like you, you knew, like you would go to a tournament and you would say, like that kid wrestles year round. He wrestles at the club. He does, you know. Right. Yeah, it's the it's those athletes that want to put the extra time in. You know, they they're the ones that rise up to become the next uh, big thing, especially in their areas. And uh, you know, David came from the Irvine. Uh, what's what's the name of the league that Irvine plays in? That was um, I don't know if it's still the same, but it was the Pacific Coast League PCL. Yeah, yeah PCL. So. Um, he was playing in the PCO league, which is just uh, Corona Del Mar was in that one too, but I think they moved on. Right. But uh, yeah, Corona Del Mar was eventually moved up and out uh, just recently, actually, I think a year or two ago or a season or yeah. two ago. So they just um, played basically just Irvine teams. And uh, 
you know, one of the, one of the stories that we like uh, the best, uh, you know, for, for, as far as David's concern is, is when he went to his weightlifting competition <laughs> uh, for all the schools, all the schools in his conference, they go and they do a combination of a bench press, um, uh, power, power clean clean. and a squat. Yep. And at the time, and this is kind of funny, um, David's team uh, brought in a, a CrossFit coach um, to, to run their uh, strength program. Yeah. And, and he came in, he's like, Scott, they have me um, running around the track backwards and, yeah. and doing and burpees, burpees and, and kettlebell yeah. swings with like 20 pound kettlebells. And uh, so we were just like, we have to, uh, we're going to have to figure out how we can kind of uh, manage this, you know, one way or another, because, right that extra movement and that extra activity is just taking away from his, you know, his sports specific yeah. training one, and it's going to prevent him from gaining weight, which for, if you're trying to get a, a scholarship to play football for, especially for an offensive lineman, you have to have the weight, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah. you know, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just kind of a, uh, a testament to kind of how a lot of these high school programs are is they don't really, um, they don't really set these kids up for success. They, yeah. uh, you know, the training that they do is, is, you know, for one, they're at a disadvantage because you have one kid who's usually the, the coach or, or maybe the head coach takes on the, the strength program and they're trying to train, you know, 30 to 60 kids at one time, let alone, you know, uh, you know, they don't even really have a good structured program or the equipment to facilitate that or the knowledge, you know, so, right. you know, you, you, uh, you know, so they're already at a disadvantage and then, you know, you bring in a CrossFit gym to do this because, you know, the booster club parents wanted, wanted to try it out. And, you know, every single one of those kids bombed the, uh, bombed the competition, except for yeah, David. I mean, for, for anyone that showed up there to compete against David would be like bringing a knife to a gunfight. It wasn't, it wasn't even close. Um, I have actually uploaded the video. It's on YouTube. I posted it up. It was like the next day I put him on, you know, his squat his clean and his, uh, bench press. It was and at the time, David was David was young. He was a young high schooler. He was only seventeen um, yeah. when that when that weightlifting competition went down. But yeah. uh, remember, I think his squad. He he was conservative on his on his because you, know, you only get you get three attempts. So he yeah. started out a little a little slower. I think he I think his third third attempt was four forty five. No, I think it was five hundred actually. I don't know if it was that much. I'd have to check. And then his, yeah. um, his bench was 315, and his power clean, he went for the record. He tried yeah. 335. He almost had it. He just, he just, he, he would have had it. He just didn't get it up. But um, I think he finished, I want to say his clean was 320 or something. For a high school. Yeah. yeah. Regardless. He, he actually ended up winning every single event on his first yeah. attempt because it got yeah. three attempts, but he beat everybody else on his first attempt. It was, it was pretty, uh, you know, pretty big difference. And his entire team pretty much blew the, uh, they blew the competition. He was the yeah, only person yeah. that he replaced, um, you know, and I think they fired the CrossFit people that after that competition, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know um, the details on that, but I know they just kind of like departed. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, in the separate ways. Right. Yeah. So CrossFit struggling right now with uh, some of the statements that their, uh, their head yeah. guy made yeah. about uh, black lives matter and COVID. <laughs> um, it just goes to show you, you know, stupidity has, has no bounds. You know, you can't, you can't put CrossFit in a, in a athletic performance training program. Anyone, any CrossFit coach that would even do that clearly uh, does not have uh, the best interests of the kids or they just, are that stupid that they think that they can, you know, get these kids mm -hmm. to the next level, you know? And can, can I ask why, why does CrossFit not benefit athletics? I just, I'm curious. Um, so CrossFit is like, um, it's like a it's circuit training. Um, but the, the larger components of it are um, that it's very metabolic in nature. So their, their concern is kind of getting the metabolism up, ramping it up, and then, uh, you know, getting as many repetitions done as possible and also incorporating uh, gymnastics and uh, Olympic weightlifting. So you got these, uh, you know, these coaches trying to like um, integrate Olympic weightlifting, which was never meant to really um, to go past three repetitions in training. No Olympian does that. No one that trains for Olympic lifting would, would ever think about doing a snatch for 20 repetitions. That's, that's, 
you know, Jack Assery at his best, um, not only doesn't wreak havoc on the shoulders, you know, uh, creating impingements all over, impingement, sy impingement syndrome, but, um, you know, it, it, every single repetition that you do after the first repetition, form is going to degrade. So when form degrades, uh, you know, your chance of injury goes up. And, uh, you know, the point of a power exercise, which is force over time, uh, becomes, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not even, uh, uh, it's pointless, you know. So the purpose of Olympic lifting is to see how much, uh, you know, uh, force you can generate, you know, as fast as possible to get a weight up as high as you can get it and then get underneath it. Um, you know, on your 20th repetition, you're not going to be able to generate as much force. So it's kind of defeats the purpose of, of applying that exercise to athletic training. So, um, you know, so, and they do kettlebell swings, a lot of burpees. I'm not sure, you know, how a burpee helps a football player, um, you know, get into shape, you know, doing 50 burpees. Um, when do you ever replicate 50 burpees on a, on a football field? When do you, you know, when do you ever do any of these exercises? What about up-downs? What about up-downs, though? Up-downs are big. <laughs> That's conditioning, but even so, if I was a if I was a a, a football coach, I I would not have my players doing up downs. You know, I would have them doing specific things like you know that are going to mimic the actions of the sport for conditioning and the duration of you know the uh, the sports uh, you know timeline. So for football, it's like five seconds, ten seconds at most, and the play is over. You know, so your conditioning should mimic that. So, but. I don't think that most coaches understand that. It's crazy. Yeah, I was always wondering why ladders and suicides and all those things were in there. Because it's antiquated methodology, you know. So, you know, they're just doing what their coaches did and their coaches did before them and, you know, and so on and so forth. But, you know, uh, athletic performance training, you know, could really, you know, have dramatic results for these kids if they just, uh, you know, applied the right, you know, methodologies. But they don't. So, you know, I think um, – uh, I think, uh, you know, if, uh, if David would have gone to a different school, I think, uh, he would have even played at, at a, at a higher level in, in NCAA, but, uh, David is, and I think Jared might be able to answer this too. Um, is David the last offensive lineman to get a, a full scholarship in the, in the Irvine league? Um, I think, I'm Woodridge, I, maybe. Yeah. I don't think for Irvine though. I, I'm not sure. But I'm sure. pretty sure he's the last from Woodbridge. He's the last from Woodbridge, but you're not sure about the greater league. Yeah, no, yeah so, I'm not sure about the greater league, especially with Corona Del Mar in there. Yeah. Well, we'll throw in Del Mar in there, but not yeah. – maybe in Irvine. I mean, yeah. He, I mean, he was, re, he was recruited by some, some – you know, at the time, no, uh, excuse me, uh, Oregon was recruiting yeah. him quite heavily. And they were – they just finished their – you know, national championship game where they lost to Auburn. But they, they were after him. Again, David was young. He was, you know, we had to do it all over again. And I'm not saying it didn't work out for him. You know, he, he went to Fresno State. He got a great career. Sure. Got I'm living in time. right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, if David would have played for Mission Viejo, similar to kind of, you know, what happened with Jarrett, I wonder where he would have went, you know. I wouldn't doubt that he would have, uh, you know, uh, yeah. played for a larger school because he had to work. Yeah, out I mean, it comes down to, um, you know, yeah, coaching. You know, coaching level is different in some, some schools. Um, yeah, know, Obviously, exactly. level of competition. Yeah, but, but he took uh, uh, master's degree classes for free, though, right? So, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, he, he got to, you know, get ahead of himself a little bit and, you know, starting his master's. Um, he didn't quite finish, but, um, you know, it's it's there for him to do, so. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, so he definitely uh, did well for himself. Um, but yeah, so that kind of leads us to, um, you know, I guess uh, Jared's story, you know. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Jared told me that um, when I don't know what grade he was in at the time, but he, uh, you know, he was playing Pop Warner. And I don't know if it was his first year or, you know, uh, or whatever, but you said that he was on the must play team. Yeah, so, Jared's. First year with Irvine Chargers. Um, gosh, I don't know how old he was. That's ten, ten years, years old. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, you know, he, he, I'm, you know, I'm. We've had these conversations. He's looked up to his brother and wanted to play football. He got a head start. Though David never played youth football, only only in high school. So Jared started much earlier. And um, you know, when Irvine put their roster together and their teams. And Jared was a must play, you know, must plays, 
um, the definition of a must play is obviously you get to play. You are limited to 10 plays. They don't have to be in order. They don't have to be in any specific quarter. You play 10 plays and you're out. So, yeah, that's the uh, the irony of all that is that uh, all these guys he played football with and Jared ended up in a <laughs> – anyway we know how it ended up for Jared so uh, yeah ended up in a much better position now <laughs> do you know if any of those kids even went on to play at the next level the only, only other one guy yeah. is Curtis Robinson kid named Curtis Robinson played linebacker at Stanford but even yeah. he was in the same situation I was he was a must play as well the coaches didn't want to play him that's don't right. you love that and that's the, <laughs> that's hey man you know lights a fire in your ass if someone told me I was a must play I will be busting my ass to make sure that the next year, you know, I wasn't in that same position. I think, yeah, exactly. you know, maybe that's what really uh, stoked the fire of Jarrett Patterson, you know, to, to prove everybody wrong, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, he's just a, uh, you know, just a competitor. He's a great athlete, you know, and um, like his brother, he wants to excel and do, do well at his craft. So, you know, Hell yeah. that's what he did. Yeah. So, um, so I believe after, uh, you know, after Jarrett uh, got out of eighth grade, um, you know, Jarrett was hell bent on uh, playing football at the next level. So uh, he was yeah. willing to do whatever it took. And I know that you were considering a different, you know, a bunch of different schools. I remember you looking at Jay Sarah and then uh, eventually settled on uh, Mission Viejo, you know, for Jarrett because they were a big school. Um, they had some good coaches there. And, um, you know, uh, and so he went into Mission Viejo and, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, found some really good coaches and, uh, you know, good mentors there. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you know, Jarrett. Why don't you tell me about your, uh, you know, kind of your experience uh, at Mission Viejo from the start? Yeah, my experience overall is, you know, really good. We had heard about, you know, Mission Viejo. It's really my dad's idea to take me there. We heard them, you know, OC register, all those different guys getting recruited and things like that. So I went down there, and the head coach at the time was Bob Johnson. And, you know, he's really cool, laid back guy. Watched practice. I I didn't really know anyone at the time at all. So, again, it was a little bit of adjustment, but, I mean, right away, I mean, I was playing left tackle. And just the coaches there, I mean, there had to have been 25, 30 years of NFL experience on a high school staff. You know, most of them had played college already. And, you know, the Coach Johnson knew a ton of college coaches as well because he'd been coaching for so long. So I kind of knew, you know, that was the right spot for me. Yeah, he could set you up pretty well. And then, uh, you know, that's where you met Sam Baker, too, right? Uh, Sam was a big influence on you. He played in the NFL. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Sam is, uh, you know, he, he did you, uh, you know, a great service to kind of get you started on your, your technique and, you know, at a higher level, right? Yeah, Coach Baker, he came in the last game of regular season sophomore year. He showed up on the sidelines. I knew who he was. He looked really familiar. I'm like, man, like that guy, I seen that guy on TV somewhere. And the next week, he, like, introduced himself to us and said he was starting to help coaching. You know, we were, we were super fired up because, I mean, you can't beat that experience. Right? He just came out of the league. He's fresh out of the league. And he just gave us all these, you know, little tips and tricks and, you know, advice of what he did and to elevate his game, you know, outside, off the field as well. And overall, he's just a really good guy. I mean, he looked out for us a ton. Man, I couldn't have asked for anyone better to coach me at that level. I mean, getting the guy to coach NFL – and want to do extra watch film with us, you know, break different techniques down, you know, tell us who we're similar to, who we could watch. I mean, you, you just can't beat that. And that really gave me a competitive edge. That's, that's really great to have, you know, people at a high level, you know, in your life like that to kind of really steer you in the right direction. I mean, that's just, I wish I, uh, you know, had a similar experience to that, but uh, you know, we all uh, get what we get. So you ended up starting as a sophomore. Um, what, Similar to David, I think it was about the third game into the season, right? You kind of – you took over the uh, left tackle spot or was it the right tackle spot? No, I was starting like right – so we went to Hawaii my sophomore year. I was working at right tackle. And within like – he got hurt the first game. So the second game I was starting at right tackle. And then after that, I kind of solidified myself. Yeah. Just starting throughout the year. And then towards the end of the year, a left tackle got hurt. So I switched to left. I remember – and you guys, uh, that sophomore you, you won the CIF title, right? Yeah, won the CIF in one state, 16-0. Imagine that you lose, your, you lose your right and left tackles and you have a sophomore step in and you still win the CIF title. So that, I mean, that's just, uh, that's just incredible, you know. What do you think it was about that team? 
Um, I think we had really good leadership, especially from we had a lot, a lot of really good seniors, which you know kind of hurt us the next year because we had a lot of you know, immature guys playing. But my sophomore year, we had a lot of good football players. Guys went D one, and our quarterback was really experienced. He had you know a year under his belt, and he was much more efficient as well. Yeah. So that really helped us out. Yeah, that was uh, you had a great you had a great high school career. I mean, um, we even went to uh, Tommy and I went to the. Um, the CIF final, uh, one of the final semifinal games. You guys went against mm-hmm. Modern Day with the yeah. Dean and Nate. So it was cool watching both Jared and uh, then Dean and Nate on the opposite side of the ball playing against each other. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I remember at the time watching that game and thinking they were so deep. I mean, it was like they just kept sending troops at you guys, like as if it was a war and they just had waves and waves of, of troops coming in and you guys yeah. were just had the same 300, you know, you, you guys were the Spartans trying to hold it down. But the one thing that really stuck out stood out to me was uh, the one part of that like that uh, game and the line that did not uh, you know that they did not win was your side. They could not yeah. penetrate Jarrett's left side of the line, um, so I think they kind of just stayed away from him and they were uh, you know they're running all their stunts to the other side. So mm-hmm. you know, how did you yeah, feel about that game compared to the other games that you played in high school? I mean, I knew it would be a really hard challenge to win because they all eleven of those guys went D one. You know, very high level you know, caliber schools. So I knew that we we're going to you know, play almost a perfect game, and that guys are going to have to step up, you know, all over the field. And it's funny that you're talking about, you know, they didn't really run so much at me. It's because um, Dean and Nate had told me that their coach staff said I was the best player on the team. And they said they had nothing bad in my scouting report, you know, because they knew, you know, what was yeah. coming. And it was unfortunate I couldn't play some defense that game. I was begging my coaches to, you know, just let me get out there, you know, stop the run or something because yeah. I, I just wanted to beat those guys. I couldn't stand modern day. I still, I still can't. <laughs> That's they awesome. had so many guys. They had so many transfers come in, all these guys from all over the place. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, it didn't end too well for us. I and mean, we, had, we had some guys, you know, going both ways just because we had a little bit of a depth issue. But it was still fun playing. And, I mean, going against other guys, you know, going places, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool, but it does kind of strike me as odd that they wouldn't use you on both sides of the ball, you know, as as yeah. uh, as dominant of a physical, you know, presence that you had in yeah. the game. Yeah, but I mean, it's, why? it's different, though, with those big schools. It's not like where we grew up where, you know, you play every position. You go yeah. – yeah, can you go out there and catch punts? Yeah, sure, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it sucks. I mean, I, I guess yeah. it would be kind of beneficial to you because you have the gas, you know, in the tank – for when you do get on the field to, to, to play every play at your hardest. But, um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't leave the field my senior year. I literally returned kickoffs, punts, played defense, offense, every position on the field. So, and I remember being tired all the time. So, I mean, I guess, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, that does benefit you guys, you know, to, to kind of go on one side of the ball. So yeah, I think I'm, they did just, you know, looking out for my health, you know. Sure. Just, and that's just good. Yeah. I think our coaches kind of knew it wasn't probably going to go well for us just because their yeah. talent, they were so stacked that year. Yeah. So they probably kind of just want to save me from Yeah. 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 For losing, why, why sacrifice for a cause that you're probably going to lose? So exactly. I understood, but I always wanted to just get out there and try to get after someone. Yeah. You're going to be off to bigger and better things anyway. And I think that's, yeah. that, I guess that's a testament to their coaching, you know, to know that, hey, you know, this is probably not going to go our way. So, you know, let's not <laughs> – Let's not uh, throw in some sacrificial lambs to, uh, you know, just to see if we can pull this game out of our butt, you know. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, w- at what point did the offer start coming in for you? Was it after um, – was it sophomore season or were, were colleges were showing interest in you or was it junior? It was like the recruiting process, how it works, you kind of gain interest. Well, usually after your sophomore year is when you gain interest. But for me, offers didn't really come into like later, like, probably March, my junior year, like yeah. March. Yeah. Yeah. March of my junior year. So going into senior year, like that spring, I started really gaining interest from quite yeah. a few schools. Yeah. If yeah. I think about, let me add something here is like a lot of guys, I don't want to say a lot, but um, some guys peak early mm-hmm. and, and these are the ones that get a little attention though. So Jared, he got better as his career progressed. So if you were to look at his game film, um, from soft, excuse me, from junior year to senior year, he had just got that much better. So when some schools started watching his senior year, his first few games, 
people realize, wow, this, this guy's better. And that's when you know, the bigger guys, if you will, the, the bigger programs um, started taking a lot of interest. And that's kind of how he was already recruited heavily. And then when September, October came around, a lot of you know, others started taking some very, uh, a lot of keen interest in him. So that's how that happened, really. And a lot, a lot of coaches commented on it, like, oh, Jared, Jared's film looks better now than it did last year. Not that his junior year was bad. He just progressed that much better. He got bigger, got stronger, you know, another year with Sam. So, yeah, it's just the way it worked out. Yeah, he was uh, – but he ended up going in as a four-star recruit, right? But, uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think in yeah, hindsight, yeah. they probably would have made him a five-star recruit. I think, uh, you know – Yeah, was, I mean uh, – a lot of bias goes on in that area. Yeah, oh, so that's that's yeah. a. I think that's a political thing, really. In my it's opinion, a shady area. <laughs> it's, See how much that fucking matters, right? <laughs> Whether you're four or five yeah, star. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Who um who did you uh, who did you play against in high school? That uh, would you say that uh, you know was recruited the heaviest? You know, like who are the guys that recruited the heaviest, and then the guys that are actually performing at that five star level? Can you name any names that you remember? Yeah, probably this guy from modern day linebacker. His name's Solomon Tulipapo. He had about like forty or fifty offers when we played him, and he was he was really good. He's had some injuries, so he hasn't been playing at USC. He went to he ended up going to USC because he's an LA guy, but he was really good when we played him as well. Another kid, he signed with LSU this past year, named Elias Ricks. He was a sophomore and played him, but he's still really talented. Um, okay. probably the probably pretty much. All the, I mean, that modern day D line, the guy at Oklahoma State, a guy went to, I was going against, went to Oregon. Um, their DN went to USC. He had about, he was a five star. So, I mean, probably all those guys I played against. I played against one kid who went to USC as a DN as well from Santa Margarita. His name was uh, Malik McLean. Okay. So, pretty much those Trinity League schools with all those guys I played against went, you know, pretty good places. And they're excelling right now? Are they excelling? Um, a little bit. Some of them have injuries, things yeah. like that are redshirted, but, I mean, they'll be coming on yeah. soon, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that kind of speaks to, you know, how important it is to be durable, you know, yeah. especially, you know, at that next level, you know, in the you know NCAA. I mean, you have to be able to take a beating. And I know, um, you know, you know, walking out to, uh, you know, against this, the competition that you're going against now. I mean, these guys, um, it's a whole different level of, of, of playing, right? I mean, you're going against these massive yeah. bodies. The, the, the speed is a lot faster. The size mm -hmm. of these guys is a lot bigger, you know? And I mean, what do, uh, I mean, what did you think uh, the first game you got in, you know, when you're playing against, uh, you know, these uh, next level guys, was it like, holy shit, you know, um, I'm ready or holy shit. <laughs> you know, I better uh, I better kick it into fifth year game. right now. So like the first time we got in like freshman year as like a backup, I was usually pretty fine. Except one guy at Florida State, he ended up getting drafted to uh, like top fifteen. The Panthers, he like planted me like the first play I got in, <laughs> just because that that dude. I mean, he's making millions of dollars now, so it's okay. Yeah. But I mean, I actually felt you know pretty good transitioning as far as like speed and strength. It's really just technique. That you, yeah. you got to work on because, you know, guys have so many different – they're so good with their hands now compared to high school. You know, guys don't rely on, you know, strength anymore. They, you know, have counter moves and you don't know what to expect in certain situations. So, yeah. that was really just the biggest adjustment. But, like, when I started this year, there was never a time where I felt like, you know, oh, no, like, I can't do this. You know, I felt, really, you know, pretty comfortable the whole time. Sure. You know, maybe a guy got me a play here or there, but, you know, it doesn't matter. There's, so I never you, got you – know, know, like in terms of like ground. size and strength and like you know uh you know just speed you think you had what you needed but it was just more of a uh, you know just having the experience and the, the technique and the footwork you know to kind of keep up with those guys that just that is that what the, the big uh, gap was for you yeah i think it's just repetition really because a lot of guys you know obviously better athletes in your college but they have longer arms you sure. know, play with better leverage and things like that so you, have to, you just kind of get used to that and you, you finally realize how you need to play to your strengths. Yeah, and you watch more game film, and then you see where you're maybe losing a step, and then you just you adjust your mm – -hmm. uh, Yeah, you know, just, just a little gotcha. thing really matter. You know, your stance, you know, everything. Yeah, that's, 
that's uh, that's good, man. It just shows you, you know, you have to keep evolving, you know, no matter what sport you're playing, the better, uh, the better you can, you know, get those little details settled in, the more you'll be able to compete at the next level. So mm -hmm. it kind of speaks to the kind of person that you are. I know that you, you played, uh, you know, Madden uh, football nonstop <laughs> as a kid. So I always yeah, wonder, yeah, exactly. yeah, I tell my son all the time, I'm like, uh, you know, Jared, he, he played Madden like as a kid, like nonstop. So he really got to know the game, you know, uh, you know, I think that's how, I think that's how you kind of got your first, uh, you know, real understanding of the game, right? So these yeah, exactly. kids have good, right? I played, I played a lot of Madden, dude, and I didn't end up at Notre Dame, though, so I don't know if it's really <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chick. You lost the genetics pool. I guess it, I guess it was because I'm 5'9", and I'm from Essex County. But... And, and so is every relative that you have, exactly. And I'm tall for our relatives, too. Though. I'm, like, on the taller side. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but you know how to make a good slice of pizza, right? Uh, kind of. My dad's way I'm all right. I'll make you some chicken parm. That's yeah. about it. Yeah. So, so I mean, this is for all of us, you know. Everyone who loves sports, especially football, all of us, you know, have seen the movie Rudy, you know. And it's like, uh, you know, you can't watch Rudy and not be like, oh, my God, this – I would love to know what this feels like to, like, you know, go to South Bend and walk out of Notre Dame Stadium through the tunnel, like, what did that feel like to you the first time that happened? Did you like, was it like, you know, you had like pins and needles on your, you know, going front through your, your, your skin and just, what did it feel like? Just, was it crazy? Yeah. It was just like a huge adrenaline uh, you know, rush, especially since you're playing Michigan. It was a really hyped up game, you know, opening of the season. So, I mean, we're, we come out for warmups. I mean, the place is really you know, filled. There's no empty seats. It was crazy. Cause you know, it was just a really hyped up game. It was a night game, things like that. And, just running the field is like surreal because it's always that. a dream of mine, you know, just to run on the field you know, in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people and, you know, millions watching at home, you know, just to watch me play some football, you know, something I've been doing for years. It's just like, it's just a huge adrenaline rush and just kind of reassures you that, you know, all that hard work you did, you know, grinding for years is, you know, it's paying off right now. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, dude. That must've been like bittersweet, you know, right there, you know, all that yeah, hard, hard good. work, all all the suffering, you know, but then you come up upon this opportunity and you made it, you know, it's like, that's the moment where you probably like, holy shit, you know, finally, yeah, you know, exactly. all this hard work has come fruition, you know, and I, yeah. man, that, that, that makes, uh, that makes my kind of, that makes me all tingly, you know, just thinking about <laughs> that. So, you know, just for you, cause I would have loved to have played for either of those schools. Ironically, <laughs> Michigan is my favorite, you know, it's my favorite yeah, team. And uh, also, ironically, Jarrett was uh, was choosing between Michigan and uh, and Notre Dame for where he was going to play, and obviously he chose Notre Dame. But I was kind of like, uh, you know, trying to push him towards Harbaugh. You know, I would have loved to have seen him play, but fucking Notre Dame. I mean, that's just, I how could you turn that down? You know, you get to yeah, play. Both, both are good schools and good, you know, historical top tier programs. Can't go wrong with either of those. Yeah, it's it's what a great opportunity you had there. Um. I guess, uh, you know, tell us about, uh, you know, kind of, you know, your parents, you know, and what kind of role they play, you know, in your success as not just an athlete, but also as a student, you know, like in high school and then, you know, in, in college, have they, uh, they, are they on your ass all the time about getting good grades or, or uh, are they kind of leave you to do your own thing? Cause I know your mom's a teacher. Yeah. They kind of left me honestly up to my own thing. My mom's you know, you know, bad grades. They tell me and let me know. But for the most part, they kind of just let me be responsible and just, you know, kind of handle business myself. And I think that's what really, like, helped me have success in college. You know, I like to stay – I learned to be really organized. You know, I let my parents, you know, do all my homework for me and, you know, keep up with my classes. So I had to figure out how to get organized and be responsible myself. And I never, I never once, you know, had a problem turning in homework. I mean, that's just like – that's like waking up in the morning. You should, you should be able to always do that and – you know, in college now, I see guys, you know, miss a bunch of homework assignments. I'm like, come on, man. Like, you know, what are you doing? That's, that's, that's nothing. That's easy. If you've been doing that, you know, since you're a little kid. Prerequisite. Yeah, exactly. That's day one shit. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I guess that's what we're getting to here is you have to be self-motivated. You know, if you want to be great, and go to the next level. You have to be able to motivate yourself, you know. And I think, uh, you know, those are the qualities that if you don't have, don't even bother moving up to the next yeah. level because you're going to end up sinking eventually, yeah. you know, and I know, um, you know, I know that uh, David and Julie, you know, that they, uh, you know, they were always there supporting you. David literally will fly out 
to see Jarrett like for like a day and then fly back just so he can see his son play and then go back to work on like a half hour of sleep on the plane. And, uh, you know, to have parents like that, that care about you that much. Yeah. What a, I mean, what a great, you know, you know, thing to have as a, you know, as a student athlete, you know, to have that kind of support system, you know, going for you. And, uh, you know, it's no wonder why, you know, you succeeded. They let you, you know, kind of take on that, uh, you know, that, all this responsibility on your own and they kind of stay out of, uh, they stay out of the way just enough, you know what I mean? So that, yeah, exactly. That you can be, you know, evolved to be the, the, the man that you are right now, you know, and I'm um, yeah. definitely excited to see what happens after this, but um, you know, what does the future look like for you? You know, um, you know, what are you studying at Notre Dame? Um, you know, I know you had good grades in high school, you know, it's, it's kind of pretty much going the same way. Um, you know, what's, uh, what's the backup plan is, I guess, what I'm saying. Yeah, so right now I'm studying uh, political science, political science major right now. So I'm kind of getting into those courses this past semester. And this next about year, year and a half will be really intensive in those courses only. And then I'm probably going to minor. I'm almost finished my uh, business economics minor. And now I'm planning, you know, because I have a fifth year available, I'm planning on using it. So I'll get a minor in something else just because Notre Dame is such a small school. So the master's programs are really limited. Okay. As far as the, you know, transition from high school to college, it was, it was a bit of a struggle at first, you know, cause it made it seem like, Oh yeah, you have all these tutors basically, you know, just do your, your homework for you. And it wasn't like that at all. They gave you a little bit of help. I mean, you pretty much had to figure out, you know, where you're learning by yourself. Yeah. yeah. I know that's not the case for most schools, though. That are, no, you know, yeah, most. Schools I know that probably like that, but Notre Dame, you know. Yeah, it's academic. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're not handing it on a silver platter. You gotta go get it yourself. Well, I've heard of other schools having like uh, they'll have you'll have like a dedicated uh, tutor with you that actually goes to classes, you know, with some of these Division One athletes, and they help them kind of, you know, they just kind of hold their hand through the process so that they don't. That's ridiculous. You know, My miss sister classes. went to Alabama, and that's what she said. <laughs> she said. Yeah. She's like, you walk into class and you see all these people who were never in your class and they're there with, like, the wide receiver. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, they don't, don't make us go to tutoring for, like, a, a difficult class that they know will be hard at least once a week. Uh -huh. but, I mean, that's just, you know, kind of help you understand a concept or any extra questions you have. They're not going to, you know, sit down and help you do your homework. Yeah. That's just not how it is there. You know, I, I think that's perfectly fine because this past semester I, I did really good. Actually, the past year I did really good as far as, you know, grades. Just because I was able to finally adjust and you know, figure out a good routine. Yeah, that's, that, that speaks to the, uh, you know, the, the accreditation of Notre Dame. If you want a degree from Notre Dame, you got to put the work in. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to help you skate by, you know. So yeah. I guess they would rather lose a football game than, than have to, you know, do those same type of protocol for their players. So, you know, you got to mm -hmm. you got to respect that, you know, that they're not having any, uh, you know, jackasses coming out of their college, you know, that can't function. In the no, they don't. Yeah, definitely one of those. They don't want to, they don't want that kind of, uh, you know, that's that reputation coming back to them. So, you know, good on Notre Dame for that, you know? So, um, I guess, uh, you know, what advice would you give like a, you know, a, a freshman or a, a junior in high school that has a dream to play for Notre Dame or play for football at the next level? You know, what would you say to them? Mm, that's a good question. I always you know, tell kids, you know, statistically speaking, only 2% of high school athletes, are going to get a Division One scholarship. So what's going to what's going to make you that two percent? What's going to separate you from everyone else? So for me personally, you watch my film, you'll see like plays on like forty yards downfield make like block. So for me, what's made me stood out is how I ran to the ball and made blocks downfield for guys, and obviously finishing. Yeah. And you also gonna be the top two percent of hard workers. Just you know showing up for your high school lift. And, you know, your mandatory meetings isn't enough. You're going to be watching film outside. You know, your school work, you know, extra weightlifting or, you know, field drills or something like that, you know, every weekend. Because that's what's going to separate you from, you know, the other 98%. You want to be in that top 2%. Yeah, I hear you. So, I mean, the main ingredients for Jared Patterson, you know, going to the next level was just doing what other people won't do. You know, the putting yep. in the extra energy, even when they're tired, even when they don't when their body's telling them to stop, you just, you just keep doing it. Keep, uh, you know, keep uh, taking yeah, care I of mean, business. Yeah, There's an element there. You'll be comfortable being uncomfortable. 
that's you know that's how you should live by that's that's the east coast west coast way right if yep, you're gonna start exactly. a death medley you got to finish it right can't be uh you know you can't be leaving your cupcakes there on the table for other people to eat <laughs> right <laughs> no, i can't be doing that I agree. I agree man i mean that's you got 22 guys out on that field if you're one person and you're disrupting the flow of the game completely or you know you're dictating the pace of the you know yeah. whatever it is mm -hmm. sport that you're doing whether you're a you know, a football player, a baseball player, you're an impact player. You know, you want them highlighting and circling you just like they did. I mean, you remember Lawrence Taylor back in the, on the Giants. They had to, like, completely change uh, offensive schemes just to deal with him because he mm -hmm. brought a yeah. completely different element to the game. I watched some old footage where the old coaches, they would have X's and O's on the board, and they would have number 56 on there only circled. You know, <laughs> could you imagine having that great of an impact on the game? And I, I love the way that you think, you know. That's uh, that's exactly how every athlete should think, you know. Let me mm -hmm, let me definitely. fuck up everything that they're doing out on the other opposite side of the ball. So, you know, uh, and I hope you keep doing that, buddy, because um, you know you gotta uh, you gotta get to the next level, man. With the we're yeah. so close right now, you know. Yeah, I think more uh, years, yeah. Couple more years, you just keep that fire going, man. And I want to see you, you know, under the big lights. So it's gonna be great to great to see what happens with you. But uh, I definitely, everyone, I would definitely look out for Jarrett Patterson. He's he is, uh, you know, probably one of the greatest athletes to come out of uh, East Coast, West Coast. And that's saying a lot because we've literally trained, you know, some of the best, half, greatest athletes in the world in different sports. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, you're, he's, uh, he's going to be no, uh, no difference to that, you know. So uh, look out for him. And, uh, um, yeah.